Hi, I'm Stephen Callahan, and in this video, with the help of Jonathan Ferguson of the Royal Armouries, we're going to take a look at the history of the rifle rings associated with Burr Barracks and the weapons that would have been used on them. The ranges formed part of the backbone of army life. Initial musketry training would have taken place on the barrack square, with soldiers learning various aiming drills. This would progress to blank ammunition and then to live practice on the range. The history of the rifle ranges at Burr can be considered an evolution. The army adapted and even changed the location and orientation of the ranges to meet the need of ever-changing firearm technology. The ranges at Burr saw the use of muzzle-loaded, single-shot muskets to bolt-action, magazine-fed rifles. The first range for the barracks was situated in the townland of Lower Clonahal. This bog land was leased from the Earl of Ross. While there is no concrete date for the range's construction, it was certainly in use by the 1840s. At this time, it would have been a single range, probably 800 to 1,000 yards long. Improvements were made in 1855 by James Kennedy, a civil engineer. Soldiers would have accessed the range by marching just over two miles along Whiteford Road and then via the Kinnity Road. Access to the range was via a small laneway. A tender appeared in the newspapers in June and July of 1859 for improvements to the range and the construction of another one. This new range was essentially an extension to the existing range. The improved range was now more than a thousand yards long, 40 foot wide with a 5 foot pat running down the centre. A more substantial entrance was also constructed along with a wooden house for officers and men to shelter during bad weather. An 1866 map of the range shows it consisted of a pair of three linear ranges with targets. Lock spits, or boundary marking trenches, ran the length of either side of the range. The southern range were 600 yards in length, the middle range were also 600 yards in length, and the western range contained firing platforms from 100 to 800 yards. Each range had its own targets and mantlets. Mantlets were boxes constructed from cast iron, where observers would stand to watch where the soldier shot landed on the iron targets. A series of flag signals were used to indicate the various hits and misses. Quite important for the range was a large area behind it for accidental overshoots. A flagstaff was used with a red flag flown to indicate when the range was being used to warn of potential danger from overshoots. There was also a caretaker's shed and a privy. The old rifle range was eventually condemned for use and a new rifle range was needed. The new range was located in the townland of Lachine, just a couple of hundred meters from the first range. It was longer than the previous one and crossed several properties in the bog. Construction was set to begin in late August 1880 and unskilled laborers would be used. The new range consisted of a large earthen backstop. Behind this was a vast expanse of bog for accidental overshoots, with red flags flown to indicate when the range was in use. The range consisted of firing platforms at 100 yards, 150 yards, 200 yards, and then every 100 yards out to 800 yards. An article in the Midland Tribune on 16th of January 1897 mentions that there was going to be a new range for Burr. This was an extension of the old range and slight change in the line of fire. This was done to accommodate the shooting of the new magazine fed bolt action Lee Metford, the replacement for the Henry Martini. The range was extended to the west, adding another 200 yards, making the shooting distance up to 1,000 yards. Additional land was also procured to the east to extend the danger area for accidental overshoots. While the Lee Metford have, had an effective range of 800 yards, projectiles could travel out to 4,000 yards. The extension made the range 4,000 yards in total length. These improvements facilitated the use of the Lee Metford and its later replacement, the Lee Enfield rifle. A map of the range from around 1812 shows that it consisted of four targets with large earthen backstop which still exists today. It also shows that the range was no longer accessed from the Kinnity Road but through a small road at Singfield. With the burning of Burr Barracks in July 1922 the range fell into disuse, however in the early 1940s the range was renovated and briefly used by the local defence forces. Throughout this video, various firearms used on the ranges have been mentioned. For context, I'm going to pass over to Jonathan Ferguson of the Royal Armouries. 
who will give a brief run through of each of the weapons that would have been used on the ranges at Burr. Hello, I'm Jonathan Ferguson, Keeper of Firearms and Artillery at the Royal Armouries Museum, and I've been asked to introduce a couple of weapons to you that were in use at different times on the ranges at Burr Barracks. This is the first. This is Bess, and you'd have got to know her very well. Uh, round about, well, 1793 in this particular form, um, until at least the 1830s. So this particular version of brown bass, the India pattern musket, was still in use as late as that. So I'm not sure what sort of target practice you might actually be expected to carry out with a smoothbore musket at that time. Not a great deal, I wouldn't have thought. We know that they did practice marksmanship with these things, despite limited accuracy potential. Uh, why, you may ask? Well, it's nothing to, nothing to do with the ignition system. The flintlock ignition system was well, reasonably reliable and robust, certainly more so than the old matchlocks that came before it. Um, not very weatherproof, that, that was a drawback. But in terms of marksmanship, you've got a smooth bore barrel, no rifling, a relatively loose fitting ball as well. And it is a ball, not a, not a bullet shaped bullet at this time. And then finally, there's the lack of sights. So there's nothing on the, on the rear. We remove this bayonet. So this bayonet would be fitted, uh, well, by command, uh, pro probably sort of 50, 50, around about 50 meters, something like that. No hard and fast rule on that. Outside of that, you would be trying to, in theory at least, hit uh, a man in the enemy formation. But this is much more of a attack the formation type weapon. You all line up shoulder to shoulder, you load and fire, and that's really your only skill as an infantryman at this time, unless you are in the rifle regiment that emerges in 1800. So the reason I took the bayonet off is the front sight. This is called the sight, and it is just a little square nub onto which you also lock your bayonet. So as soon as you've mounted your bayonet, you've got no ability to aim with any precision at all, and even with this, uh, not exactly brilliant. But old Bess here was capable of uh, more than people think. So 100 meters or yards, doesn't really matter which, effective range, man-sized target, if I can do it, as a museum curator, anyone can. So that's the India pattern musket. So in that, in that form, 1793 to at least the 1830s, uh, we then graduate, well, we don't really graduate, we leap forward with this. The pattern 1853 Enfield rifle or rifled musket or rifle musket. They all mean the same thing. In military terms, at the time, a musket is just a long infantry weapon that takes a bayonet. It could be smoothbore, it could be rifled. However, the musket, the, the name musket was so synonymous with smoothbore by this time, they did add that additional rifle or rifled, you'll see both, to the beginning of its name. So if you're ever wondering what rifle musket means, it's... Something that carries out the role of the musket, but with a lot more precision, <laughs> because it has, I don't know if you can see at the end there, quite deep, well, sorry, quite shallow, quite shallow rifling grooves. Um, now, the Baker rifle that came in between, the specialist only weapon, that had some, some quite deep grooves. You were hammering the bullet into the grooves so that it was actually fitted to that rifling groove and would be spun effectively when you fired. Um, this weapon used a new system called the Minier bullet. It was the first bullet-shaped bullet in use uh, with British forces. Uh, well, not quite. <laughs> There's a, a larger version that comes before this uh, that was taken to the Crimean War. But later in the Crimean War, this and this bullet that I'm talking about were introduced. And it's an expanding bullet, but not in the way you might think. It's not expanding to uh, incapacitate the enemy. It's expanding at the back to grip the rifling so you don't have to hammer it in or to jam it in with the ramrod. So you've got the reloading speed of a, of a smoothbore musket. It goes down with a bit of, bit of welly, uh, 
getting harder as, as you fire more because of the carbon that builds up. But when you fire, the pressure opens up the base of the bullet and it grips that rifling for that all-important spin to stabilize the bullet. Coupled to that, uh, our front sight is still a bayonet lug. I haven't got out the bayonet, but it's functionally um, the same as the, the old brown bass one. It has a little blade now on that block. So you've got a precision point of aim for the front and you've got adjustable sights at the rear for the first time for mass issue at any rate. So you've got uh, essentially a battle, a battle zero, and then you flip it up and you slide this up and down with your maximum being the top. So that would be your sight set at maximum and that creates quite the firing angle to lob in these still quite big heavy lead bullets. So we've gone from 0.69 caliber for the musket ball down to 0.577 for this, the pattern 1853 Enfield. And you actually are looking at 900 yards for as your maximum uh, sighted range. And believe it or not, they were capable of lobbing shots in at 900 yards, not to hit individual soldiers, but to hit artillery uh, installations, uh, troop formations, that kind of thing, or just to harass the enemy. But um, at rifle ranges, um, places like Bisley, you can shoot these things out to a thousand yards and actually hit the target. Uh, it's a tremendous leap forward in capability. Added to that as well, we have a much more reliable ignition system. The percussion ignition system works just like a toy cap gun. When you pull the trigger, it hits a cap that you've placed on that nipple there, flashes through to fire the main charge. Much less complicated and much more reliable than the old scrape bits of steel off a bigger bit of steel, which is how the flintlock worked. Very, very significant weapon indeed. Used in the Crimea, used in the American Civil War. Um, the single biggest leap forward in capability in British military long arms. And the final type that we have in use on the earlier ranges at this site is what we tend to call the Snyder, but its correct name would be the Snyder Enfield, because as you can probably see, it's not a million miles away from what you just saw, the pattern 1853 Enfield, and that's because the first ones were pattern 1853 Enfields with the back end chopped out. So you've no longer got uh, percussion caps firing the weapon. This is just a protector, by the way, for the firing pin. You now have a, like a trap door, press this button, or on later versions, you just flip it open. Flip it open. Give it a yank, out comes your empty cartridge case because we now have effectively, I think it's more like a shotgun cartridge at this time, but with a, the same 577 lead bullet sticking out the front. Shove in your round, close it up, full cock, and fire. The hammer now hits the back end of the firing pin, which pushes through onto the front of the breech block to fire that self contained cartridge, which is basically the same thing as we have now, just a lot more primitive. Um, all the same capabilities, but now you're loading from the back, which means you can load in the prone, you can load more rapidly. Uh, it's just, it's the way forward, clearly, because we still use cartridges today. So that's the Snyder. Bit of a stopgap design, because it is a conversion of the existing Enfield. Uh, now, a lot of them were made new, though, and they were in um, like non-frontline use and colonial use for a very long time indeed, into the, um, well, toward the end of the 19th century. So this comes in in 1864, officially, um, starts to see issue from 1867, and it's sort of supplementing the, the P-53. So your frontline troops get this. This is true of all of these. Frontline troops get the latest thing. Um, that's true today as well, in many ways. And uh, so it's yeah, still around until the 1890s uh, in a minor role. So moving to the second range at this site, um, forward in time, of course, we have 
well, not quite abandoned because it's still around for um, sort of second, third line troops, but your, your front line infantry, your teeth, arms, if you like, have moved away from the Snyder Enfield with that um, massive, still massive, 577 bullet. And we've gone down in size to 0.45 or 45 or 0.450. Martini, because this is the Martini Henry. And if you've seen the film, the 1960s film Zulu with Michael Caine, you've seen these in use. Um, and it's the scratch designed breech loader. So the Snyder was like the stopgap, chop the back off a rifle musket and stick in a, a breech mechanism. This is a purpose built breech mechanism from the get go. And so it's still only single shot, but you drop the lever, which opens up the breech shove in your cartridge, which is still massive, <laughs> but it's a, a smaller diameter bullet, 0.45, so it's going at a faster rate of speed. The cartridge case is, sim well, it's, it's longer, it's got more powder in it, you're getting more velocity out of this thing. Smaller, faster projectile, it's more capable. And you're looking out beyond, in theory, 1200 yards with this thing. Same basic sighting system, hasn't really changed since the P-53, it's just got bigger because we're shooting out to longer distances. Now, across, across the whole span of time, uh, effective range is more like 500 yards for, for actual combat use, of trying to hit any one guy or even a small group of enemy soldiers. Uh, anything longer than that is for large targets. But it's a great system. You, you yank down on that, that lever, your empty case, go, the, the harder you give it welly, the, the harder the uh, cartridge case comes flying out, well clear of the weapon, so you can instantly take another round from your pouch, shove that in, close her up, and then you've got a, a nice trigger pull-off there. Um, better than previously, this can now be quite a light pull-off. That has activated the cocking indicator there. There's no hammer on this now, so for your, for your NCOs to know what state your weapon's in, and you, you have this cocking indicator shaped like a teardrop. This is in the cocked position. If I decock safely, don't like to fire these off too much, you'll see it goes to the forward fired position. So, ease springs. So that's the Martini. This is the uh, Mark I. In fact, I'm, I'm showing you nearly all Mark I's just to show you the earliest version of the thing and some of the nicer examples that we have. This is in good condition. Bayonet still very important, in fact it's important throughout this entire period we're talking about uh, and there are changes to the bayonet. And in fact there's a bewildering variety of bayonets available for the Martini but the standard was still the same uh, socket type bayonet. Basically going back to brown best days. It's more refined, it's better made but yeah same thing. Really nice bit of kit. Um, if you ever do get the chance to shoot one of these, definitely use the thumb rest. That's what that is. That's why it's uh, shaped like that. If you, put, if you wrap your thumb around the receiver, you're going to get hit uh, by your own knuckle. So the Martini. 1871, it's official introduction, but it's not, as usual, doesn't reach the troops for a few years, and it starts to replace the Snyder that came before it. Um, but by uh, the 18, well, by by the incidents uh, depicted in Zulu, 1879, you have um, basically all of your frontline troops armed with the Martini, and the rate of fire has gone from three rounds per minute with the musket, um, or the P53 for that matter, to uh, 12 to 15 rounds per minute. Um, for uh, maximum for the Martini Henry. Now, um, the next leap forward is the magazine rifle. We've also gone for the bolt action as well. Now that would prove to be the way forward. So this is 1888 we're looking at here and this is the Lee Metford. So it's the action designed by James Paris Lee who was a Scots Canadian which is the whole of the action body with the bolt action mechanism to allow you to safely lock this so it's you know, no pressure is escaping, the gun's not going to blow up and all of the pressure is going down the barrel for a nice accurate shot or powerful shot. That's the cocking indicator so you know the thing is cocked but also bound up in uh, Lee's patents 
is the design of the, of, the, of the action body itself and the magazine. So the first version, this, the Lee Metford, has only an eight round magazine, but that's still seven rounds more than you had previously, i.e. going from one to eight. Original idea was you'd have a spare magazine like you do today, and when you fired your eight, you'd drop this and it would hang on the chain so you didn't lose it, and you would slap in a fresh mag and crack on. Um, that was ba uh, abandoned before the rifle was ever issued, so they just left the chain on in case uh, people lost their magazines when cleaning. And the magazine was only ever to be taken off for cleaning, and that's true throughout the entire British Lee rifle's history, from 1888 through to just a few years ago when the number 8 cadet rifle finally went out of service. All the same family of rifles, all based around this Lee action. So what's the Metford bit, you might ask? Well. It's the rifling in the barrel. Simple as that. The naming system at the time was, oh, for a brief, relatively brief period actually, was the mechanism, so Lee, and then uh, William Metford's pattern of rifling. It could, could be, well, this is, this is why the Ma Martini Henry was called the Martini Henry, because it was Alexander Henry's pattern of rifling. So without boring you with the details of the rifling, uh, they're, all, they're all spiral grooves of one sort or another. That's why it's named that way. So the Metford, a um, little bit hard to identify if you're looking at photos from the, the Boer War period. This is really the, where this thing uh, shines, um, arguably, although Mauser fans might say otherwise. You can sort of spot them. Um, they can't tell them from the Longley Enfields because they are the same basic configuration. You, one clue, it's not hard and fast, but it's pretty reliable, is, are these grooves in the grip. An early attempt at ergonomics to give you a better grip on the rifle, but with um, the vast majority of Lee Enfields, the long ones, look identical to this. Uh, they didn't have that groove. Excellent weapon, and now your rate of fire is very soon going to be demanded by your commanders at 15 rounds per minute, minimum. And the maximum for this family of bolt action, which is very slick, very quick, operated with finger and thumb, much faster than I can do it was 25 rounds or more per minute. Absolutely astonishing rates of fire. Uh, approaching kind of uh, effective rates of fire for some machine guns when, when used on, on mass. And there's a story from the First World War, a bit later than this, of uh, a German officer who was captured who said, we thought we were facing machine guns from your chaps because the rate of fire, accurate aimed fire, was so good. And so, after the Boer War, where this thing proved a bit long, heavy and cumbersome and rifle skills weren't really where they needed to be, that's when the most iconic Enfield rifle emerges. So here is what I would call the most iconic of the service Lee rifles, the British Lee pattern rifles. This is the SMLE. So the the Metford uh, was actually the Magazine Lee Metford, 303 caliber, incidentally. So we've gone down from uh, our 45 caliber down to 0.3, our 30 caliber range, 303, with higher velocities, yeah, so 2,400 feet per second, uh, significantly more than the old sort of 900 feet per second ballpark of basically everything that came before it. A modern flat shooting, long range, accurate magazine rifle, the Magazine Lee Metford that I showed you just now. This is the Magazine Lee Enfield with the upgraded rifling. It was more uh, resistant to modern hot burning powders, but it's the short Magazine Lee Enfield. Short in overall length. So without this whacking great bayonet on the end, which we'll take off, it's Short. You can see, I can actually fit this one on camera. I couldn't fit the Lee Metford on camera. Um, really quite short and handy. It's a similar sort of weight uh, and length to a modern rifle, in fact, or some modern rifles. The sights are somewhat more, uh, well, somewhat upgraded over previous forms. So we're going up to 2,000 yards on the main tangent sight. We no longer flip it up. We use a ramp and we adjust up to the maximum. And that, as you can see, is pretty dramatically long ranged arcing fire not the norm you would normally be set at well 200 3 4 5 up to 6 maybe maybe if you're optimistic up to 800 meters a skill shot on a range 
uh, would be able to reach out to 800 meters, 800 yards with this thing. Um, this was redesigned essentially from the Longley Metford, from the Longley Enfield, based on the lessons learned in the Boer War, fight, fighting um, skilled hunters, uh, farmers, but they were also hunters, the South African farmers, um, uh, uh, known as Boers. They formed themselves into commandos, which is where the name comes from, commando, sort of uh, militia type units, and they weren't necessarily as, in some ways, as well trained as the British, but in other ways, they, they were out shooting the British. So part of that was the technology. So they, um, well, to try to counteract their, their Mauser rifles that a lot of them had, and to learn lessons from that Boer conflict. 1902, so the, the year that that comes to an end, um, they shorten the rifle, as mentioned. By now we've got 10 rounds in the magazine anyway, so another two rounds, which is nice. We have charger loading introduced. So this bridge on the top allows you to take a, a stripper clip or a charger clip of five rounds, push that in, loading the magazine instantly with five rounds, and then you can put another one in to give it its full capacity of 10, which you would do before contact. But then when you reload, you are reverting back down to five round capacity. People forget this. You're generally going to only have five rounds in the, in the rifle in the middle of a firefight. Uh, if you get a lull in battle, you're going to top it off with another five rounds. So this is actually the Mark III SMLE. So this is what they took to the First World War. Um, it got simplified throughout the course of the First World War. The cost of making millions of these things was too high to not knock a few edges off. Um, but this still has some, some of the older features. Um, and the final upgraded feature with lessons learned from the Boer War was instead of having the sights right at the back and right at the front, we'll keep them right at the front for obvious reasons, but we have a, a nice robust sight protectors, so the front sight can't get damaged, by the way. But the main, the main event here is moving the sights from back here to here, halfway down the barrel. You look at a modern Kalashnikov rifle, well, not that modern, but <laughs> you look at a Kalashnikov rifle, Similar short sight radius. Call it the sight radius because you know as you as you aim, uh, the sights describe a, a radius effectively. Open sights as well. Open at the top, a notch, like pistol uh, sights, not like aperture sights, uh, which is on older. It's on the uh, Longley uh, Enfield and on the Lee Metford and on the Mauser, where you have a, a ring. Like modern our modern iron sights are the same, where you have to precision aim by putting the front sight in the ring. Not the case with open sights. You can quickly bring them to the shoulder. You can see over the top of the weapon at the, the enemies that are moving around in front of you. It's a much more close range, close to medium range effective set of sights. That was the idea. But I just wanted to end on the bayonet because all of these came with bayonets, of course, and they were all seen as to, to a lesser extent over time, but, but in some ways as important as the weapon itself. Because even with 10 rounds, when you run out of 10 rounds and you're only carrying 120 rounds on your person in the First World War, this is what you have left. Um, now, it's, it's got, it got short in between, it got long again because you needed the extra reach in theory. They're still thinking there might be cavalry on the battlefield, so you have to be able to reach up with this on the end of your rifle to defend against cavalry. Um, and, and relatively elaborate bayonet training, well, maybe not elaborate, but uh, far more training than most armies uh, conduct today, still going on in 19, well, through to 1918 at least. This is the pattern 1907 version of the Enfield bayonet. And that short magazine, the Enfield sea service, right the way through to the end of that family of rifles alongside the number four rifle that's introduced in the Second World War. Uh, both of those are around uh, in one form or another until the 50s when they are both replaced by the L1A1 self-loading rifle, the famous SLR. With, you know, same, same basic sort of technology in terms of ammunition, but a, a shorter, slightly lower recoiling cartridge. Not so you'd know it necessarily. <laughs> and uh, 20 rounds and semi-automatic fire uh, and uh, well that's the future but as far as the ranges that were the range uh, two uh, phases of range use on this site that we're talking about those are those two batches uh, so you've got your, your brown bass your p53 and your snyder enfield 
all in use of the early phase range. And then you've got your Martini, your Lee Metford, and your, well, all of your other Lee Enfields. We haven't shown you all of them, including the SMLE, uh, on the second phase. I hope that was of interest.